Um, thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. And as the final speaker today, I just want to again thank the Decorative Arts Trust, Matt Thurlow, the Board of Governors, uh, Catherine Carlisle, the Decorative Arts Trust staff, and Dr. Carol Van West, just anyone who has made this symposium possible. Um, it truly is an honor to be the John H. Sweeney Emerging Scholar during this symposium. And I want to thank all of you for taking the time to come to Nashville and learn about our state's material culture and history. Um, because I think this is a crowd who will appreciate this. Like Tracy, I'm a seventh generation Tennessean, um, and I have a real passion for Tennessee decorative arts. Um, so taking all of this into account, it really feels like a full circle moment to be able to share with you about Tennessee and our decorative arts history. And as you can see, uh, my presentation is titled, Trust Much in the Patronage of a Liberal and Enlightened Community, Portraits of Early Tennessee. And the title is taken from a newspaper advertisement published by the artist Ralph Earl in the 1830s. And he's advertising his new Nashville Art Museum, which would also showcase his own artwork. And today, that museum is considered a predecessor to the Tennessee State Museum, which you've been to. And I include this excerpt because community is a key word as we think about Tennessee portraiture. And as with all decorative arts, these paintings, the sitters, and the context in which they were created do not exist in isolation. And that is what I want to talk to you about today. Thank you. Thank you. So as you all have been venturing across Middle Tennessee for the past few days, I know you've been to countless sites. They're probably all running together right now. Um, but before we delve into the portraiture from each of these places, I want to help us kind of get resituated with um, some of these sites and how they relate to one another. So in this image, uh, you can see a drawing of Nashville. And although it was drawn in the um, mid-1850s, it's actually drawn from memory of Nashville of 1804. And the red star is where you are sitting right now, the Holston House. Um, and the key at the bottom lists other sites that were present during that time, such as offices, taverns, the jail, and the courthouse. Um, and even though it's as early as 1804, you can see that a city plan is starting to be laid out. So keep this in mind. We're going to jump ahead 50 years. The same um, artist has created a map of Nashville in 1854. So you can see just in 50 years how much the city has developed. They've used that same town layout and continue to grow. And so again, Holston, Hotel, uh, Holston House, where we are right now, is the Red Star. And so while some of the street names have changed, this is still the general layout of downtown Nashville. And you can see about three blocks to the left of us is Capitol Hill, where this Tennessee State Capitol is. And even at this time, the Capitol's not finished. It won't be finished for another five years in 1859. Okay, so we're resituated. We're in downtown Nashville. So we're going to zoom out a little bit to look at some of these sites that you've seen. And um, the yellow star is Grundy Place that's no longer, uh, doesn't no longer stands, but again, that's about where we are in downtown Nashville. And so from the blue circle at uh, Crackfont all the way down to uh, Carton where you'll go this afternoon at the red circle is only about 50 miles. It's less than 50 miles. So this shows you um, just within this proximity how situated they are to the Cumberland River, which has long been a major thoroughfare of Middle Tennessee and is instrumental to our river commerce. Um, and it shows how some of the wealthiest families of the area have kind of congregated together in this same general vicinity in the early to mid-19th century. So now that you can see these sites in relation to one another, let's try to look at some of the people who lived there. Uh, don't worry, this is, won't be a test. It's just to kind of help group you. So, find where I am on my slides. Um, so you might recognize some of these faces. Some of these paintings are hanging in the homes and sites and museums that you've been to. And as you would expect, many of these families are affiliated with one another. And of course, they often will intermarry. For example, Felix Grundy in yellow, uh, his wife is Ann Phillips Rogers, who was a patron of um, the downtown Presbyterian Church in Nashville, which I think you went to this week. And her sister is Mary Rogers McGavick of Carton, where you'll go this afternoon. And you can see how those two women are outlined in yellow. And Randall and um, Mary McGavick's daughter, Elizabeth, would marry into the Belmead family. It just keeps going. And their children will intermarry. Their grandchildren will, inter will intermarry. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea of how connected they all are. 
so of course, in this period of Tennessee history, I know you keep hearing the name Andrew Jackson, and I'm going to mention him too. Um, so Andrew Jackson, of course, um, is a lawyer, soon to be U.S. president, and many of the men in this, in this grouping are affiliated with him in one way or another. So for example, all of the men in the kind of polka dotted pink line um, have some kind of connection with him. I'm sure the other men at the bottom do too, but the pink ones are a little more, little more um, closely connected. For example, Felix Grundy will be a U.S. Senator during Jackson's presidency, uh, and um, the uh, Harding family, John Harding at Belle Mead, Jackson will uh, house some of his horses at that plantation as well. It just, uh, he's everywhere. So I want to make this connection to clear to you to show just how interwoven everything is, and the decisions that each of these people make do not exist in isolation, and most of, if not all of the people you see here have exerted their influence and their desire for influence far and wide throughout uh, the state. So in an effort to display their wealth and power, of course, this resulted in commissioning of their portraits. So again, we're gonna kind of regroup them. I wanna help you visualize, <laughs> help by color, um, just some of these sites and the different uh, portraits that are there. But we're gonna reorganize them now based on the artists who painted them. And I only chose four of Middle Tennessee's artists. There are countless more. We don't have time for everyone, so this is what we're gonna talk about today. So here they are, regrouped under um, some of the artists that you've heard about this week. Uh, Washington B. Cooper, Ralph E. W. Earl, John Wood Dodge, and James Hart. Washington B. Cooper and his brother William were extremely active in Middle Tennessee, and it's estimated that at uh, Washington Cooper's height, he painted up to 1,000 portraits a year, and that's based on his account book. So um, he's, he's painting everyone, he's painting living people, he's, he was later recruited by the Tennessee Historical Society to paint um, Tennessee governors posthumously. He, you find his paintings all throughout the state. Ralph E. W. Earl will move to Tennessee to essentially become Andrew Jackson's personal portraitist. And while he painted countless portraits of Jackson and his family, you can see that he's also painted many portraits of Jackson's associates as well. Moving on to John Wood Dodge. Uh, Dodge moved here from New York and he was an accomplished miniature portraitist. Um, and he moved here in the 1840s with his brother who was also an artist. And he painted, as you can see, many of uh, Tennessee's elite and their families. But I also included James Hart, who's not very well known, but I wanted to show you that um, he's an artist based out of Memphis. Uh, like Tiffany, I'm a West Tennessean as well, so I had to include Memphis. Um, and so while he's not as well known as the artist next to him, he periodically visited Nashville for work. And in this little advertisement in the bottom corner, you can see that he said that he was working out of John Wood Dodge's studio, the artist to his left. And so I demonstrate that to show the power of connection in this community because Dodge was painting some of the same um, family members of these uh, really influential sites. So um, the two that you see here are of John Overton of Traveler's Rest and then Carrie McGavick and her son Winder of Carton, just as a little shout out for what you're gonna see this afternoon. This particular portrait though is in the Tennessee State Museum's collection, but in a turn of events, Washington Cooper also painted Carrie McGavick, so you're gonna see them on over and over. So while we're focusing um, on Middle Tennessee, let's kind of look again at how these sites are once again are, are connected to one another. Again, we're resituating ourselves and we're gonna scale back a little bit more to only talk about at this point the Hermitage, Belmont, Belmead, and Traveler's Rest and their ties to our state's agriculture. So as a quick reminder, the Hermitage is of course home to Andrew and Rachel Jackson. Belmont, as we learned, was the summer home of Isaac and Adelicia Franklin. Belmead, the home of the Hardings. Traveler's Rest, home to the Overtons. Andrew Jackson, of course, we know who he is. A future president, influential lawyer, politician, military figure. Isaac Franklin, um, to his next, to his right, um, made his wealth as one of the most prolific slave traders of his time with plantations across Tennessee, Louisiana, and many other southern states. And after his death, his wife, Adelicia, would remarry, I think, two more times and become the wealthiest female slaveholder in the American South. The Hardings owned one of the most successful horse farms and plantations in Tennessee, which we're gonna get in more into. And John Overton of Traveler's Rest was also an influential Tennessee politician and close friend of Jackson. 
So while all of these families have close ties to Tennessee politics, their reputations are also closely linked with Tennessee's own self-proclaimed agricultural identity. So what you see here is an 1837 edition of the Tennessee Farmer, which was a guide to agriculture and horticulture. And although it was published out of Jonesboro in East Tennessee, it would have been uh, disseminated across the state. And due to our state's diverse topography, each grand division of East, Middle, and West uh, offered unique planting opportunities. And I make this important point because while we do see ourselves as a, as a state of three grand divisions, agriculture is something that really ties us together. And that was brought in when uh, we were founded in 1796 because agriculture has been a cornerstone of our state identity since then. And it was memorialized in our state seal. So um, in the original Tennessee Constitution, there was a provision for the creation of a state seal. And here you can see various iterations of that over time. Uh, a copy of the original one is to the far right. And um, it has really largely gone unchanged in the past 220 years, just some minor tweaks. But to the untrained eye, you really wouldn't notice much of a difference. And in 1801, the Tennessee Senate put forth the parameters for the design, which you can see here. It called for including the word agriculture at the top of the seal, including the symbols of a plow, a sheaf of wheat, and a cotton plant. And also underneath, you see the word commerce, which was included due, to, again, to the importance of our river commerce and how goods and commodities from the state, both agricultural and living people, were sold along the rivers. Remember, this river commerce includes the Cumberland River, which is very close to where we are now and has been flowing um, through Middle Tennessee and all of these homes and plantations which you've been visiting. So overall, it took about five years from the original call for a state seal for it to actually be created. And the original, uh, the early Tennessee leaders who created the seal knew it was important to create a lasting image of how they viewed the state, what they saw as most central to our state identity, but also how they wanted other people to view the state. And many of these guidelines are central to also how portraiture is used as well. Both are a visual representation of how people view themselves, but also how they want others to see them too. So just for fun, because I work in an archives, uh, here you can see the call for payment for the creation of the seal, um, which was sent to a member of the uh, governor's staff and issued payment for the iron for the press of the state seal in 1802. And the same year, the state seal was used on um, many important official state documents, including uh, this commission for Andrew Jackson to be Major General of the Tennessee Militia. And again, even on important documents like this military commission, they would be reinforcing the state's ties to agriculture and commerce. And while it has largely since faded, it is now the remnants of it, it looks pink on this screen, but it's red in the upper left-hand corner of the document. And it has our governor's name, Archibald Roan, um, in the center. And so um, over the next 10 years, Jackson would continue to rise to the ranks and of national consciousness. Because as you see here, he um, became Major General of the Tennessee Militia, but also he uh, became Major General of the United States Army and became a national celebrity and the hero of the Battle of New Orleans after the War of 1812. And to commemorate this moment, he again, he recruited and commissioned Ralph Earl to come to Nashville to paint his portrait in his uniform on the battlefield. And this was the beginning of a long partnership between the two men, which you've heard by now. Earl ended up staying in Nashville, became Jackson's unofficial portraitist. But Earl was also extremely influential in crafting and maintaining Jackson's public persona through visual imagery. In these three portraits uh, by Earl, you can see the different ways in which Jackson wanted himself to be portrayed from military leader to lawyer politician, but also as a planter. And in that portrait, take note that it is titled The Tennessee Gentleman. Seen in his suit and planter's hat, Jackson's hermitage is in the background with two of his horses in the middle ground. And the portrait demonstrates that his status, um, it, that his status is that he is not as actively surrounded by livestock or crops. Instead, he has distanced himself from the actual labor and enslaved laborers of the hermitage. But in this depiction, he is still connecting himself with the life of a planter, and this would allow him to be more relatable to his fellow farmers. And remember, it would also connect him with his adopted home state of Tennessee and its connection with agriculture, which would then assist him in his goal of being seen as a man of the people during his reelection campaign for president. 
because during his reelection campaign in 1832, the key issue was around um, the idea of the National Bank of the United States and whether or not it was constitutional. Jackson's stance led to political cartoons like the one you see here, depicting him as King Jackson. His opponents believed that he was violating the Constitution, so the headlines on the cartoon read, King Jackson I, born to command, shall he reign over us or shall the people rule? Just the exi existence of a cartoon like this demonstrates that Jackson's place as a populist president and man of the people was called into question. Earl's portrait was created around the same time and Jackson as a planter, or a Tennessee gentleman, would have been in direct contrast with the depiction of Jackson as a tyrannical monarch. It would have been up to the American public to determine which they would believe. Well, today we know he was reelected um, at least two more times, and he won the reelection campaign of 1832 by a landslide. Even so, it's still telling that there was an effort from Jackson's camp to carefully craft the way he wanted to be seen. Um, I'm going to try to speed up a little bit, but here you can see that Earl's portrait was later turned into an engraving um, after Jackson's death, so it shows that Jackson's legacy is still tied with the idea of him being a planter, a man of the people, and a relatable figure. Um, and I also included his planter's hat, which was on, is on display at the Tennessee State Museum, and it makes it really notable that this is Jackson's hat as opposed to just a regular planter's hat because it has the mourning band from when his wife Rachel died. So now, moving away from Jackson, but still thinking about agriculture. The role of agriculture was also important not just to the sitters, but to the artists working in Tennessee as well. And we've talked about John Wood Dodge. He's a successful miniature portraitist working in Nashville. Came in the 1840s and 50s from uh, New York. And this is one of my favorite stories, so I, I'm going to try to speed it up, but it's, I think it's very interesting. So um, he comes here to be a miniature portraitist, but he decides that as the rise of photography grows in the 1850s, he doesn't want to do photography, even though he's good at it. And he wants to focus on being an apple farmer. So he advertises that he sells his, he's going to sell his studio and focus on apple farming at his farm called Pomona um, near Nashville. And so in doing so, he becomes a very successful apple farmer and wins, um, in this premium you can see he wins best variety of apples at the Tennessee State Fair, and then he's keeping a log of the type of apples that he's producing, and this one's called summer cheese, and he concludes a description of what it tasted and looked like. But when Tennessee seceded during the Civil War, Dodge and his family fled the state as they were unionists and returned to New York. And there he did return to portraiture and photography, and would, would eventually come back to Tennessee and his apple orchards. So as we've gone through some of the artwork and ties to agriculture, you've probably noticed who is not being depicted in these images, the enslaved laborers who were responsible for the wealth that came out of these sites. This is a painting of Southern Cornfield, Nashville, Tennessee, which was created by a Vermont artist during the Civil War, 1861. I include this to show you that there are paintings of enslaved laborers, particularly the agricultural workers, that do exist, even if they are difficult to locate. Um, and I think this one's particularly noteworthy because while we don't know the names of these people, the artist chose to specify the geographic location. It's not just a general southern cornfield. Nashville is included in the title. And unfortunately, it's in a Vermont museum, um, but it was documented by one of the digital initiatives that Dr. West mentioned um, on opening night. And in this clipping from Harper's Weekly, you again, you see the state seal with the plow, but the artist has now included enslaved laborers as well as another key component of Tennessee's agricultural identity, the livestock, and in this case, mules and horses. Like our Kentucky neighbors, Tennessee has its own rich history of horse breeding and grooming. This portrait, which you probably saw at Belmont, um, is of Adelicia Franklin and her horse, Bucephalus. So again, Belmont is the summer home for the Franklins, but they had another home in Middle Tennessee called Fairview. And there, Adelicia and Isaac Franklin lived with their family but also 138 enslaved people. And while Isaac Franklin uh, made the majority of his money as a slave trader, Fairview was a plantation that also had a small horse business. In the inventory after his death, it is listed that they also owned 16 thoroughbred horses and 26 work horses just at Fairview. One of those horses uh, might have been the one that you see here, Bucephalus, which was named after the one that belonged to Alexander the Great. Um, and while Adelicia was a known equestrian, 
if you see her in her riding gear. Uh, she also enjoyed the prestige of horse riding, but was probably not actually taking physical care of the horse and all of its entails. It was instead likely one of the many enslaved people at Fairview who trained, groomed, and ensured the daily care of the cephalus. And one of the Franklin Harding's neighbors was the man you see here named Daniel Graham. Um, he was another Tennessee politician. His plantation was essentially next door to Belmede, which is not far from Belmont. Um, and while it's a rather unassuming portrait, it's what Graham documented in his account book that sheds life on life um, sheds light on life in Middle Tennessee. So, as Tiffany talked about, relying on documentary records, um, over the course of nearly 50 pages, Daniel Graham documented the lives of the enslaved people on his plantation and the work that they did over the course of roughly 15 years. This is important to emphasize because the presence and labor of enslaved people on these farms and plantations was responsible for the sitter's ability to then afford portraiture but in doing so, the enslaved people were then largely removed from the final products. In these accounts, Graham writes about the marriages, the births of children, deaths of family members, but probably what he saw most as important, what work they did and what he deemed them good to, to be good at. Here, for example, um, there's a gentleman named Edmund who worked as a cowboy, a water carrier, a plowboy, and then he married an enslaved woman from Belmede next door. Joe Kelly also worked the, plow the plows. He drove horses, but was also later sold to Belmede. A different man named Joe worked the plows. He carried water. He drove wagons, and he was an ox driver. This man named Jackson also worked the plows, a cowboy. He built stone fences, which you'll see all around Middle Tennessee. And interestingly, at the bottom, it says he ran off with the Federal Army in Nashville, which means he likely joined one of the contraband camps here. So as you've, as you've heard, the Harding's name mentioned a couple of times so far, you can see that this account book demonstrates again the community and interconnectedness between these families, whether it's through politics, agriculture, or the lives of the enslaved people. This man, William, um, worked as a full field hand, and I bring it up just to show the names that you keep seeing. You see uh, he gets an argument with the Harding's overseer, who's later on sent to John McGavick's house, but then he dies of typhoid fever after being sent off to East Tennessee. So it's important that these stories and documents are used to demonstrate the extent of the work that went on in regards to Tennessee's agricultural identity, the people who were largely responsible for the wealth, um, and that their existence is often confined to the documentary record rather than the visual one. So the Hardings living next door to Daniel Graham, um, we're gonna try to speed this up, this is like the key point, um, is, uh, they're a major horse family around here, um, but you see here that uh, in doing so, John Harding, um, actually, let me go back just a second, is um, in 1860, when John Harding first buys what becomes Belmede, he places an advertisement for the breeding of one of his premier horses. That um, farm would go on to have its own registered horse jockey uniform, and then it would continue to expand under his son, and the success would continue. In the 1850s, they start not just painting their family members, but they start painting their horses as well. And this is an advertisement for that horse, Epsilon, and his uh, breeding pedigree. And um, we know that they're one of the wealthiest families, and they're also one of the largest slaveholders in Davidson County, which is where Nashville is. And that is likely due to the tremendous wealth that came from horse breeding and the people that were responsible for it. And we can say that with more certainty um, that enslaved people were training these horses because of the research and work that's been done at Belmede in recent years, largely, thank to Bridge, largely thanks to Bridget Jones. And it's because of paintings like this one, thanks to Case Auctions and, um, and um, all the records that they keep online, we really appreciate that, because this portrait of Robert Green, horse groomer, and the horse Bonnie Scotland. And although it was painted after um, and during Reconstruction, it's the paintings of horses at Belmede that now include at least one of the people responsible for the skilled labor that led to their generational wealth and success. Robert Green was born enslaved, and he and his parents were given as wedding gifts to William and Selena Harding of Belmede. He worked on the plantation, probably doing all sorts of jobs, just like the ones you heard about from the neighbor, um, Daniel Graham, next door. Robert Green would go on to be the lead groomer at Belmede and one of the most successful horse groomers of his time. He trained horses like this one, Bonnie Scotland, who at one time was the leading sire in all of North America. 
And this is an incredibly pe important piece of Tennessee's decorative arts history, but it also speaks to the fact that this exists likely because of Robert Greene being seen as an exceptional black laborer, when there at one point were over 100 black laborers working alongside him at Belle Mead, and thousands more just across Middle Tennessee. Even in the 1870s, Tennessee portraiture tied itself to the impact of our agriculture and sent a message of what was deemed important enough to be seen. Thank you so much for um, going on this very quick journey with me through some of Tennessee's decorative arts history. And um, thank you for letting me bring Decorative Arts Trust's newest member and, um, and just looking at the context of which all this was created and some of the aims of the sitters. Thank you again to the Decorative Arts Trust and all the sites that you've seen today.